Welcome back to this farmer interview series here with Global Farmer Network, where we continue to tell important stories and messaging from our Global Farmer Network members. I'm your host, Delaney Howell, joined today by Case Hoisinga, a Ukrainian farmer. Case, I'm sure many of our members have seen you really active on social media, in the media, and uh, talking to policymakers here over the last eight months. And we're going to get to that later on in tomorrow's series. But today, Case, I'm so excited to talk to you about your background and want to welcome you to our farmer interview series. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad as well. Pleased. So Case, you grew up, as I understand it, in the Netherlands, but now you're farming in Ukraine. Tell us a little bit about that background and path to get there. Yeah, I grew up in the north of the Netherlands and my mother is from a farm, but my, my father was a general practitioner, uh, but we lived in a small village and I've been working all of my life and playing on, on farms in the neighborhood from, uh, and on the farm that my mother grew up. Um, yeah, and there my interest grew for, uh, for, for farming. Uh, so after uh, high school, I went to uh, Wageningen Agricultural University, and uh, I had a lot of fun there as well. Uh, and that's that's the beginning of my farming story. And from there, I went to uh, to Poland, to Russia, and ended up in Ukraine, where I am now. So, your mom's family farm were you guys actively living there growing up, or was it her parents that owned the farm that you would just occasionally visit? That was her parents that owned the farm, and then her sister with her, with her husband uh, they took over the farm. So and we regularly visited them. So uh, and I worked a little bit there, but not a lot. Mo mainly I worked on uh, na uh, neighboring farms in our little village. Mm. And what was it? Maybe maybe there wasn't one specific moment you remember, but was there a moment or a series of things that happened that showed you farming was where you wanted to end up? No, it's just... You know, I, I kind of lived a farming life, I guess, in the village. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we we went to these haystacks playing around there. And then uh, there was a farmer who had uh, horses and we helped him. Uh, we, I helped him uh, cleaning uh, the stables and stuff, you know, as a kid. And then you know, that's kind of how it grew. And then I went to another farmer who was a potato grower. Uh, so we... We were start harvesting potatoes by hand on the sides of the ditches where you couldn't get with the with the harvester. Um, doing the sorting inside the barns, uh, you know, was all terrible work. But and then, but later on, I was I could drive on a tractor, you know, and then it became more fun, you know, and and then and then kind of that's how it grew, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So you went to college. Then you get out of college and do you head straight to Ukraine thinking that's where you wanted to farm? Well, when I went to Wageningen University, a few years earlier, the, the Iron Curtain or the German Wall uh, came down. Uh, and already, I think my cousin went to Poland. Uh, and maybe some friends or family or... or uh, people I knew or farmers I knew went to Eastern Germany and then from uh, from the university we also did some excursions to Eastern Germany I visited my cousin in Poland you know and that's how I came to know the and uh, Eastern Europe um, you know and by the time I got finished Eastern Germany Eastern Germany was already um, divided among the farmers Poland was already divided you know everybody got settled already uh, but Ukraine, there were still a lot of opportunities. So in, in Russia as well back then. So, um, you know, so I decided to go further east. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how, how, uh, how we ended up in Ukraine. So you made the decision to move to Ukraine. Did you purchase a farm from there or how did you get into farming originally? Um, no, I have two partners. One, I mean, one sold his shares uh, to us. Um, and they started a year, a year before I came here. Um, and, you know, we can, you, you can only rent the land or lease the land. You can't uh, buy it. 
Uh, well, now actually you can, but only as a Ukrainian uh, citizen. Uh, so, but still we lease most of the land. Um, yeah, and we just started in a village. We came in this village, the name of the village is Kishinsi. And uh, when they started here, they came here through a German, Ukrainian uh, kind of project. And they, uh, they went here on an excursion and they were guided by, uh, by a Ukrainian woman who spoke uh, fluently uh, German. Um, and then the end of this uh, excursion, it lasted a week, I think, they told her, please find us a farm. And that's when she started. So then she started because they were uh, uh, they were amazed by the huge size of the fields and uh, and good logistics you could do here, the good roads uh, they were here um, cl close to the Black Sea port. Um, and then, uh, but it was all overgrown with weeds, W E E D, um, and uh, so you know you could get it very. You could rent it. I mean, for 10, $15 per hectare per year, which is nearly nothing. So, it was, and they had some used machinery on their farms in, uh, in Eastern Germany, which they could relatively easily bring here. You know, so yeah, it was easy to start. You just had to take the risk. Um, you know, and then and there's, there's this woman, Oksana is her name, she's still with us. She found three farms which were, which were ready to sign lease con of people and villages, which were ready to sign uh, lease contracts with us. And um, you know they picked Kishinsi, you know that's kind of accidentally how we ended up here. And mm. now it's the best, uh, it's the best village in Ukraine, of course. <laughs> wow, that is a great story. I love that you kind of were taking something from nothing, and you were building this farm to start uh, with you and your partner, kind of by yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, of course, in the Soviet times, they used to work it, and then when the when the Soviet Union fell collapsed. Um, you know, it, it, people were not used to to take their own in, initiative. You know, it was all planned from above. Right. And they were executing it, and uh, yeah, so it it slowly fell apart uh, until they didn't have any money uh, to, to work the fields anymore. Uh, also, the logistics within Ukraine were not that uh, not that good as they uh, they are now, or if they were before the war started. Mm -hmm. um, so you know it was difficult for uh, for the people, and you know, and if you don't have any um, market mentality, you know, then it's difficult to to get started. And of course, a lot of people managed to to start, but this village uh, this village did. But I mean, back then when we started, I think there was maybe more than fifty percent of Ukrainian land wasn't tilled, wasn't worked on. Yeah, and I think that's been the interesting thing, you know, as we've seen the conflict develop between Russia and Ukraine, I think especially in the Western portion of the world, maybe Europe more so, but in the US, we definitely, I don't think, paid as close attention to that Black Sea region because we just didn't realize the agricultural significance that you guys play and contribute to the global food supply. And I know we're going to talk about that more in part two of the series, but current day case what does the farm look like i'm sure you've expanded a little bit and changed some things since when you first originally got started yeah when we started we started i think with a, yeah around a thousand hectares that's maybe like around two and a half thousand acres uh and so over the course of 10 15 years we grew to fifteen thousand hectares uh it's like forty thousand acres or something um and we, when we took over one old, like a coal host, that's how it was named. Uh, we took it over like in 2006, 2007, there were like 250 dairy cows there. So, um, you know, we also inherited the cows and back then the easiest would have been to, um, to slaughter all the cows and forget all about it. But uh, since we are renting the land from the, the workers, I mean, I'll explain it later, but uh, we decided to keep the cows to provide the people with work. Um, and, you know, it started with 250 cows and now it's 2000 milking cows plus young stock. And like 10 years ago, I found a Dutch partner with whom we started uh, vegetable growing, so that's uh, onions and carrots with drip irrigation. 
we have storages, cooling storages, um, and that together is around 300 hectares. So Case, you rent and lease a lot of your ground, as I understand it, a lot of hectares or acres that you guys are farming. What does that process look like? Yeah, so we're renting it from the people and also from our employees uh, who used to work at the former Soviet uh, coal houses, as they are called, the collective farms. Um, and after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the land was state owned and they privatized it. And all the workers and former workers of these uh, collective farms, they got a, a piece of land, roughly around three hectares, which is like seven, seven, eight acres or something. Um, and yeah, they still have it. It's all fixed uh, by law. It's all official. And we are renting from, from them and from the people in the village. So in, in total, we have like uh, close to 5,000 lease contracts. So that's a huge, um, a huge uh, safe full of, <laughs> full of paper. Uh, you know, and it's officially registered. So it's, it's pretty safe. Uh, it's very safe to, to have your land in this, in, in this way. And on average, I think our lease contracts are uh, close to 15 years. Um, you know, and with, with some long-term lease contracts for, for 50 years and some short-term for, for a few years. So kind of that's how, how our land uh, situation is. So do you have to pay rent to each of those 5,000 different, I'm going to call them landlords for the lack of a better term? No, it's their landlord. So yeah, they, they own the land. So we are yeah. really renting it from them. Yes. And on a yearly basis, we pay them. Uh, now, actually, in September, October is the time for us to pay to pay uh, land lease. Um, and and it also, uh, still, a third of the people, they take their land lease in kind. So they take mm -hmm. uh, wheat and barley and corn and they get some sunflower oil and some sugar. Uh, and, and some, some vegetables and uh, flour, but that's kind of it's mainly all elderly people who take this. That's their that's that's how they grew up. That's what they used to. And younger people, we used to pay them in cash, uh, so they were because they didn't have bank cards. So uh, we were dragging around uh, this, the villages these huge huge bags. With uh, with cash money you know, on the shoulder <laughs> and paying it to the to the people, but over the last couple of years we managed to um, to uh, convince them to take a bank card, and now I think ninety percent mm. we wire by bank card, and and still this ten percent we either have to pay in kind or in cash money because you know it's elderly people who don't who don't know how to deal with bank cards or they never see uh, ATM cash machine so you know that's still kind of a service we, we, we do to these people so how many different crops do you grow yeah so the arable crops is, is winter wheat winter barley winter canola uh corn sunflowers there were soybeans and sugar beet those are the main crops navy beans as well but we're still playing around playing around a bit with them and then you've got the dairy, which sounds like that's a lot of animals that you guys are taking care of. Tell us more about that side of the operation. Yeah, that's a modern, just a modern modern dairy farm, you, which you will find in in the north of uh, USA or in Canada. Uh, it's also kind of the whole logistics is kind of based on the American Canadian uh, dairy farmers, but it's a big farm, of course, and. At the moment, we have two modern barns with a thousand cows each, and still one old Soviet uh, barn um, for for the young for young stock. Um, and we are building a new barn now as well. I mean, we stopped it when the war. We started building it already last year, and we stopped it when the war started. Um, but we can't sell. We can't really sell slaughter cows. Price is very low. Uh, we can't sell bull cows, bull calves, um, and we can't sell heifers either. Mm -hmm. There's just nobody, just nobody buys them. We can't export them either. Um, so you, so we don't have any place. So we are forced to, uh, we we are forced to continue constructing. I mean, otherwise we, 
yeah, we can't put our havens anywhere. Mm. And it, I mean, but the dairy has also been very good for us be, uh, when the war started because that's kind of a regular cash flow. So it was not so um, it was not suffering from from uh, from export uh, block 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 from the export blockade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to touch on exports here shortly, but I'm also curious, you have a family as well. Tell us a little bit more about them and raising them on the farm. Yeah, I, they lived here with the, all of us here and um, with my wife and two daughters. Um, but we already decided before the war that after sixth grade, they would move to the Netherlands. So, uh, and my oldest daughter just finished uh, sixth grade la last uh, schooling season, and now they started seventh grade in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, but we, I mean, they were not born here. I mean, they were born in the Netherlands, but immediately after birth, or a month or so later, they, we, they, they moved back here to Ukraine. Um, you know, so they grew up here. Uh, they're fluent in Ukrainian, they're fluent in Dutch. Uh, they went to the local school here in the village. Uh, they have uh, a lot of friends. They they miss their friends, of course. Now, um, you know, but they're also getting used to <laughs> to the Netherlands and to their new schools. So that's uh, that's good. Uh, yeah, but they miss they miss it here, and uh, they you know they had a lot of fun here, and you know it's in the middle of nowhere. You can make as much noise as you want. You can make fires what you want. You can drive around on you you don't have to be afraid of of, of heavy traffic or anything so uh, you know they liked it a lot mm. how interesting uh and i know you mentioned that you moved them prior to the start of the war which obviously probably felt like a good feeling but for the rest of the people i assume you guys have a lot of employees how have you convinced them to stay no, well, actually, my wife. Now we were still living here. I still had to finish school, you know, when the when the war started on the twenty fourth of February. Actually, when my wife was on the airport in Kiev. She was supposed to fly out to the Netherlands for a few days, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, uh, then was uh, um, mentioned that the uh, planes didn't fly; they didn't leave. You know, so it was kind of fun, and then. Um, then a friend of mine, she was on one airport on the west side of, it, of Kiev, and a friend of mine on the east side of the Kiev, she uh, sent me a message, say they started uh, bombing um, the airport on the east side. So then I called my wife, said, get, get out of that airport as, as fast as you can because the Russians started bombing Ukraine. You know, so she left Kiev, this was like four, five o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, and then she came back. It was all very emotional, of course. And when she drove here, she saw the bombs exploding left and right of the highway. Uh, you know, and that, yeah, so yeah, everybody was kind of panicking. And towards the end of the day, we decided we decided that she would leave with the kids to Romania to a friend of ours, which she did. So yeah, they actually fled the war. Um, you know, and the and they went to the Netherlands. Afterwards, and then after a few weeks, they, they started in Dutch uh, school. So that's uh, the, what they were only supposed to start in the first of September, twenty-two, and but they started a few months earlier. So, yeah, and the other people on our farm, yeah, they don't. I mean, I stayed. My my partner in the vegetables, he stayed. So you know, I mean, it's also their life. You know, it's their income. It's our income. It's uh, you have the cows. Um, you know, yeah, their families are depending on this. So yeah, everybody was staying. You know, of course, a few people left, but from the employees, nobody left. So uh, yeah, some some of the guys they send their families uh, abroad, uh, but most of them stayed. Okay, so I think that's a great place to stop part one of this series. And let's pick up tomorrow with part two, where we really kind of dive into the last eight months. Viewers, please tune in with us tomorrow to catch part two of Case's story.